So you've probably heard of some of the most famous Gothic literature books. So these would be Dracula by Bram Stoker, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, The Mysteries of Adolfo, and even Into the Works of Emily Bronte and Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. So the genre of Gothic literature combines horror, fiction, death, the supernatural, and even romance sometimes. So the origin <laughs> attributed to Horace Walpole with his novel published in 1764 called The Castle of Otranto, I believe. And throughout the genre, there's an emphasis on emotion and enjoyable terror for an audience that reads these novels. Um, it's believed to be an extension of romantic literature and the movement experienced throughout 1700s, 1800s. And the most common reason for these books is for the pleasure experience or the sublime, which is a feeling that takes man beyond themselves and beyond nature. And that brings us to the rise of the supernatural, the feature of ghosts, um, the feature of, in Frankenstein, these created beings that are almost blasphemy going against God as a creator. So its main success was from the 19th century with Mary Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe, and also elements shown in Christmas Carol um, with this bleak and supernatural settings and ideas with the ghosts, the past, the present. And Gothic is often to refer, is referred to during this period as Goths, which later, later translated to Germans. And there's a reference to Gothic architecture of the medieval era in European history. And this can also be seen in German history as well with the Gothic period originating there and in Europe, which actually comes into architecture of the day. And this can be seen in famous landmarks such as the Cologne Cathedral, which is very dark, very mysterious, different shapes, gargoyles, all these supernatural beings that come and originate from these books from this period. So we're now gonna lead on to Millie, who's going to talk about Mary Shelley's classic, Frankenstein. Um, so Mary Shelley is often considered to be the um, <laughs> the kind of first person to write a gothic novel because she came from the Romantic era. She was married to Percy Shelley, and her Percy Shelley and her and also Lord Byron were all fascinated by the Greek myth of Prometheus. Um, who gave, he took fire from the gods and gave it to humans and it resulted in kind of advancement for the humans of their society because they were able to cook and forge weapons with the fire. And um, so Frankenstein explores the idea of taking something, a godly power and giving, putting it in human hands so um, Frankenstein himself discovers that he can um, induce life in uh, well creatures basically so he builds his own and this kind of idea of unchecked scientific discovery and the danger it poses to the natural order which the natural order is obviously something romantics are fond of and stress the importance of and so this this danger and um, threat of unchecked scientific discovery uh, can draw easy, pa easy parallels today with the kind of f fear people have of artificial intelligence and how it might begin to possibly take over. And this also slightly disturbing idea of genetically modifying babies before they're even born to give them certain traits and things like that, which Frankenstein does with his monster. He picks out all these traits which he believes to be beautiful. He gives it a sculpted body and ultimately all these different kind of aspects of beauty create a monster. Um, and then obviously this, this fear of unchecked scientific discovery, which Mary 
um, explores in her novel, which was written at a time of technological and scientific advancement, is seen in the uh, film industry today with films like Ex Machina and Terminator, which explore this idea of AI and science. So Mary Shelley has obviously had a great influence on this whole idea, and it's mirrored today. Yes, so through the idea that Millie's spoken about, about creation, creation of a being that is unthought of and unknown in this world, can be seen today in science and, like we talked with the AI, artificial intelligence, and it's believed by many critics to have paved the way for scientific fiction and sci-fi fantasy in today's society, and also paved the way for different arts, such as the film industry, so gothic horror movies and music featuring gloomy and supernatural undertones. Um, and these all stem from the literature, such as rock music and the goth movement in today's society with, I don't know, dark clothes. Yeah, these. dark, kind of like bold statements. Yeah, and there's many links in modern gothic literature to the foundation set by Mary Shelley, um, and these can be seen, so the most famous that we probably all know of is Stephen King, the work of Stephen King, so through It, The Shining, and the films that have now been made out of these ideas, they all encompass this supernatural being, these clowns, these, um, these ghosts, these zombies, all these different films that many people get enjoyment out of all stem from Gothic literature. Yeah. And in modern works, so take The Priest by Thomas M. Dish, it's believed to be based on Matthew Lewis's The Monk, which was, uh, and he, his book here was believed to be a founder of the Gothic literature movement. But also um, The Jamaican Inn, which is a book by uh, de Maurier. And it's inspired by a body of female Gothics, including heroines, which was as shown, as I spoke before, in Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. It refers to these women swooning over um, and being in terror of these Bi Byronic, from the Byron period, men. Um, and it's this symbol of traditional Gothic literature, of women being held captive, women being tortured by these men and being surrounded by these supernatural spirits. So Tilda is now going to talk to us about effect on other modern arts and specifically TV with the recent Dracula series that was on BBC. Yeah, so one of the most recent adaptations of Gothic literature was the Dracula TV series that was released this new year on BBC and Netflix. Uh, it was tackled by the creators of Sherlock, Stephen Moffat and Mark Gattis, who explained that they face a unique problem in adapting Bram Stoker's novel because there are so many conceptions about Dracula that have been rooted not from the text at all. So apart from Louis Jordan's 1977 BBC adaptation, just about every other version of Dracula takes its own route. So Moffat explained that the tradition is that you take your own way with it, and that's what they did. And I think it's clear that in their adaptation, Moffat and Gratis have tried to modernise Dracula to reflect society's attitudes today, especially in the way that women are portrayed. And as a reaction to the surge of feminism in media, especially following the Me Too movement, there's been a greater effort to place women in more powerful, gender stereotype bending roles. And this is clear uh, because Van Helsing in this production, or this um, TV series, is changing to a woman. And also, whilst in Stoker's novel, Dracula mainly preys on and victimises women. In this series, they are openly defiant towards him and it's the female incarnation of Van, Van Helsing that uses Dracula's own blood to deduce how to defeat him. So unlike in Stoker's novel where he's defeated by a horde of men uh, defending Lucy and Mina, two female leads victimised by Dracula, he is killed by a woman. And alongside a few more plot changes, such as Mina Murray having a much less significant role and the reinvented voyage on the Dementor to London, the most jarring change is the time jump to 2020. So that happens in episode three. And Dracula has like a mobile phone and he's using Skype uh, and he's finding victims by, by swiping through dating apps. 
So there's no doubt that the creators are trying to appeal to a younger audience by making this classic story more relatable. However, the viewer rating for this series was strikingly low when compared to previous New Year's features like Luther. I think it was always going to be hard for Moffat's new series to live up to the well-loved brick cult Sherlock. However, it's possible that people are bored of the same stories being retold. I mean, there have been over 20 adaptations of Dracula since the book's release in 18... 1897 and hundreds more parodies so why is it that we continue to rinse Stoker's novel I don't think that we're running out of inspiration or fresh ideas in, in the film industry but I think because of the way that we are consuming media with streaming sites there's a constant demand for new content quickly so a recreated classic such as Dracula seems like a guaranteed success however in reality I think many people would just want a true original adaptation. Yeah, I think there's quite, I think there's definitely evident to see the huge effect that um, gothic literature has had on sort of modern like arts and lifestyle where, oh, I don't know, well, if you look at music, someone like Billie Eilish, from the music videos that I've seen, quite a lot of the themes are quite sort of gothic and black and mm. dark. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think there's just there's a sort of general uh, like theme of gothicism, I guess, or just the gothic coming through in literature today. I think also in a, going back to an absolute classic, uh, Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, the portrayal of the gothic in that is that there's kind of a mix between the genres of a gothic novel and a uh, Newgate drama i believe it is thinking from gcse i think there's there was newgate novel that i oh, i can't remember whether that was more gothic or whether that was more hopeful but there's just sort of elements of uh gothic drama i think and like influence from gothic literature everywhere you look i think that's fair to say do you agree yeah, yeah definitely well, it's set in dark bleak Areas like I said with Christmas Carol, it's and in adaptations as well. This year's BBC adaptation, it's yeah. the whole setting seems to be in this sepia effect, with yeah. mm -hmm. dark and lighting to show this mystical sort of atmosphere mm. in all of his books. Because with Great Expectations, particularly, there are scenes that are quite sort of hopeful and joyous, uh, like with you know any scene with Estella, maybe where he's hoping to win Estella's hand. But then obviously you've got Miss Havisham. Well, Miss Havisham, as an example, in Satis House, where, you know, all the clocks are stopped, it's very dark, the curtains are drawn, um, you know, Miss Havisham's still wearing the same wedding dress that she wore when she was jilted, um, just sort of stuck in the past, really. And then Miss Havisham's death, for an example, this quite visceral sort of burning of her character as, like, a release of all her pent-up anger and frustration against men... Um, when Pip forgives her, is just well, it's just more evidence of the gothic of gothic literature and the gothic style being present, sort of all over the place, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess also to an extent, dystopian novels draw on the bleak atmosphere, and yeah. use that as kind of a basis of that genre, yeah. which has become popular very rec very recently with Hunger Games and things like that. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Cool, I think that just about wraps it up.